Okay, I, th I think we're going to get started um, now. So thank you everybody for surviving the boat trip and coming this morning. It looks like we only have about a fifth of the people on the boat that made it, so hopefully some more people will come later. And I've got no idea what time Hero will turn up. He was pretty happy last night from his um, <laughs> award, so that, that's great. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome you to the uh, final keynote for ISMA. And this is a keynote given by Alvin um, Graylin. Actually, Alvin and I go way back. We were at the uh, University of Washington together where he was supervised by uh, Tom Furness, also my supervisor. But he went on to MIT and, and to greater and better things than, than I did. So he's um, had a long history in industry. Um, after MIT and um, at the University of Washington, he worked on AI natural language processing. And then he went to work for Intel, Trend Micro, WatchGuard, and IBM and then founded four different startup companies um, in AI-based natural language um, search, mobile search networks, and big data analytics in China and the US. Um, however, since 2016, he's worked at HTC, of course, one of the leading um, VR providers, um, as their China president, heading up and leading all aspects of the Vive VR development and um, smartphone businesses. But this year, he started a new role at HTC as, as the global VP of corporate development um, driving key partner engagements for the company um, worldwide. And so we're very lucky to have him here. He's also attending the South by Southwest um, conference, which is happening, or event that's happening in Sydney and, and talking there as well. Um, Alvin's a really sought after keynote speaker at many major conferences around the world, and he talks on topics like immersive computing, artificial intelligence, entrepreneurship, venture investment, and how to operate companies in China. And um, on a personal note, Alvin plays golf and is also a very accomplished um, boxer. So he's a great person to have on your side uh, during a fight. So make friends with him, and he can protect you and also give you great technology. So let me um, welcome Alvin to the stage, and um, let's all give him a big hand. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you for uh, getting up early. I know last night was a little rough and uh, probably had a few extra drinks. But I will try to make sure you guys don't fall asleep. Um, and it's a real honor for uh, Mark to be my uh, introducer. I think that was uh, very nice, and uh, I will try to meet, meet up to your expectations. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, immersive education and how it's applied to both human education as well as AI education. I, I think we're going to be we're entering a very special age right now, where humans and machines and digital intelligence are going to be uh, more and more part of our daily lives. So we're a very lucky generation to be able to see this happening. And in fact, to be able to play a role in this happening. Right. Uh-oh. It worked earlier. Um, OK, I guess I have to get this close. <laughs> so we're at a generation where multiple exponential technologies that people have been talking about are now finally happening and finally maturing, right? Everything from genetic uh, engineering, okay. genetic engineering to, uh, to make us live longer, um, you know, clean energy to give us unlimited power. You have AI to make us smarter. And of course, immersive technology that will allow us to travel to, to any world we want. Uh, okay, but of course, every technology is a double-edged sword. So we need to make sure that we have this gift, and but we're using it properly, using it in a way that is good for, good for the world. Although I actually I'm not a big fan of the concept of double-edged sword because it feels like it's either good or bad, and the reality is that it's always in between, right? It's much more of a yin-yang type uh, philosophy where all technology will be used for good and bad, and it's our job to try to you know, shift it more towards the positive. So, you know, as uh, Mark mentioned, I, I've kind of gone through multiple generations. I, I started, you know, programming in the 80s and then making and selling PCs in the, in the 80s and then uh, getting into uh, designing chips to, to power the web and, and uh, in the 90s and uh, started multiple startups in the, the mobile internet space in, in the 2000s. And then the last eight years or so, I've been, uh, I came back to the, the VR space uh, and really wanted to, to, to come back because I see that 
the, the potential for it's really going to be here. You know, when I first started in VR, you know, as Mark knows, I mean, the devices are giant, the prices were, um, you know, amazingly high. It's just nothing that was possible for it to reach the, the consumer space. But we're, we're at, at a time where it's actually very, very viable. So, you know, these were the kind of devices that, that we worked with. And uh, as Mark mentioned, you know, here's uh, Tom, our, our uh, advisor, and you know, he's, he's done a lot to, to really help. In fact, this morning I, I just chatted with him because uh, I sent him a picture of uh, Mark and I and, and Rob yesterday, and he was so, so happy. He's like, I wish I could hug you guys. So, but you know, in 93, I started to uh, work on uh, AI and natural language processing and, and, uh, and then went to, to, uh, to MIT to work on symbolic uh, AI. So I've kind of done both sides of it. Um, and then in 2005, I actually created the first natural language search engine in China uh, using mobile, mobile technology. So we were doing Q&A based search, kind of like what uh, Bing Chat is doing now. But we did it in 2005 and was working with all three Chinese carriers to make that happen. OK, so now let's get to the meat of the presentation. Um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there in the world in terms of what AI can do, what XR can do, and how it can be applied to, to education. So let me kind of walk through a few of it. First of all, I think a lot of people think XR is a fad. I know you guys don't, but a lot of the world still does. Um, a lot of people think it shouldn't be used by children. Um, I actually think it can be and can be used very well. And I, I will give data to, to bust all of these myths uh, during this presentation. So in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, hopefully you'll get answers to all these. You know, people think it makes you sick. Uh, in some cases it does, but uh, for most people it does not. Uh, it's cost prohibitive. We, we all know that's really not true anymore. It's, it's coming to be the cost of much less than even a phone these days. Uh, and you know, a lot of people think they're st stochastic parrots that AI you know, cannot create. And I think that's actually not true. So I will leave this here to, as a reminder. And uh, people think AI makes you dumber. Uh, just like people used to think that writing makes you dumber, that calculator makes you dumber, that the internet makes you dumber. I think it's uh, something that would be proven very soon that it does not, and it actually makes us all a lot smarter than, than we ever been. And then, you know, there are, there are teachers who think AI, using AI in, in education is cheating, or kids using AI is, is cheating. Uh, not true. Um, people think that I can use technology to detect AI. Not true. <laughs> people think that teachers will not be needed anymore. Also not true. So I will give you data to show all of this stuff that is not true. And people think that there will be more jobs made from AI than, than they will be displaced. There's some question on that, but I also think that is not true, and I will tell you why. And then uh, lastly, uh, well, the last two things kind of. A lot of people think AI can, alignment cannot be done. We're going to be you know, doomed and killed by AI. Uh, I will tell you why I don't think so and why I think the world will actually be a better place because of the uh, emergence of AI and the combination of AI together with XR. So, jeez, uh, we need to fix these buttons. <laughs> so let's go on a little field trip because I, I think, you know, we, as people in education, you know, field trips are, are the best way to, to get your your uh, you know learners excited um, first you know what what is the metaverse uh, it's a term that's a little confusing a lot of people are very uh, gives a lot of different definitions and tie things to it that may or may not belong together uh, I, I'll give you my simple definition which I've actually checked with uh, with uh, Neil uh, Stevenson and he agrees with it which is it's the 3d version of the internet powered by AI and mostly interface through XR Right. So it's something very simple, you know, just because the, the simpler it is, the more it can be used. And right now there are people who write page long definitions of what the metaverse. And in, in five years, 10 years, that term may not be what is used to refer to this 3D Internet. Just like, you know, uh, people used to say information superhighway for the Internet. Nobody says that anymore or cyberspace or whatever. Right. But uh, the concept will definitely continue to be there. So. Here's uh, me and Neil using our latest devices. You know, so we're going from these giant boxes to something like this that's completely self-contained. This thing is um, 100 times the resolution of what we used back then, 400 times cheaper, right? and uh, about 15 times uh, lighter. <laughs> so with, with technology, content, they, they evolve together. Right? And what we've seen is that over the last 100 years, We've gone from you know, paper to radio 
to TV, to gaming interaction, and then now to XR. And at every stage, the content becomes more and more high fidelity, more and more interactive, right? This is why I, I say, you know, because we've been working on a 2D internet for the last 30 years, right? Video, text, pictures. We're going to move into immersive space, and that's something that is inevitable. And not only is the content becoming more natural, uh, the interface will become more natural. Because we're, we've been trained on using very unnatural devices like keyboards and mice that does not represent how we interact in the real world. Whereas what we need to do is to be able to use our hands, our feet, our bodies, our eyes, our mouth as the key interface for computing. And that's where we're headed. And that's where we're going to create a lot more accessibility. You know, I, every few days I get a call from my mom saying, oh, my, my iPad's broken. And I'm like, oh, can you just maybe push this button or you know, show me a picture of what it looks like? And you know, something that is as simple as an iPad where most people take it for granted that it's very easy. But for you know, elderly or for young kids, maybe it's not. You know, when I started with HTC, we, we had to create boxes, you know, uh, uh, base stations and lots of cables and, and, you know, lots of setup and every, you know, get a big computer to, to power it. Now, you know, we're getting to devices that are completely self-contained. And it's not just us doing it. Essentially, you know, everybody in the industry is now following. So we were the first to come out with these thin and light devices. But now, you know, whether you're talking about Pico or Meta or Apple, they're all creating these thin and light devices. And not only are they VR devices, they are also MR devices, AR devices, because they have pass-through. And that allows us to bring the real world together with the virtual world. And I, I think that's something that will change the way in, the interaction happens. And it will take away what people, a lot of people fear is that you put on this headset and you're escaping from the world. You're, you're, you're dis disconnecting. And the reality is that we are always having a, in a mixed reality world, right? And so, the fact that we have devices now that makes it a little bit more easily for you to get into that, that world is even better. And screens have been something that you know, we take for granted because we have dozens of them in our lives. Right? But a lot of people don't realize 100 years ago, there was no screens. You said, well, 120 years ago, there was no screens. And in 1895, the first screen came, which is the biggest screen, which is you know, the, 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 the movie screen. And after that, every few dozen years, we would get a new screen in our lives. Uh, and if you look at this trend, you're saying, hey, look, we're going to keep adding screens. That's the trend. And the, the, the reality, at least my prediction, is that these, these screens will disappear. And they will be replaced by the screen that's on your head. Right? And the more we go, uh, the more capability goes into these devices, the more easily we can replace the screens that used to be on our walls and in our pockets and on our tables. And at some point, we're going to get back to where we used to be, which is no screens again, because we're going to, you know, according to Elon, we're going to have a chip in our head. I'm not sure if I want to do that yet. But uh, at some point, it, it may be something that becomes a lot more natural. And not only is the devices we're using changing, but how we use them is changing. Right? We used to be mainly on TV, and then we used to be mainly on computers, and now we're mainly on our mobiles. But in the next few years, that trend will, will change. We will have a new leader for a device that will be our primary consumption device. And it is going to be you know, these kind of devices because something that's already on your head, you're essentially going to wake up with it when you, you know, when you wake up. The first thing you do right now is look at your phone. When you wake up in five or 10 years, the first thing you do is put on your smart glasses, and it will tell you everything you need to do. And then it will create the virtual screens that we used on a daily basis. Right? I think that's kind of the, the model that Apple has been trying to promote with their new you know, uh, the Vision Pro. Uh, at first, I, I, I wasn't a big fan of it. But the more I thought about it, the more it makes sense that you start with a killer app that people already know. So you're not, you don't have to change behavior. So uh, you know, they didn't do as much of the immersive side, the interactive side, the mobile side, the walking around side that I wanted. But I think they will get there. And, and um, it also leaves a lot of room for the rest of the players to play while they you know, kind of do some of the heavy lifting in, 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 tr in transitioning people to a, uh, a head-worn computer versus a pocket or desktop computer. So you know, all you guys are academics. So you, I'm sure you've all seen this, this learning pyramid. And we know that, that you know, just using lecture, just using text is not enough. People don't retain it. 
you have to get them to use their hands, you have to get them to interact, you have to get them to come back and actually teach uh, others. And how we've been teaching AI in the past have actually been uh, very limited. We've been using just text, right? We've been just giving them the text that's on our internet and saying, hey, here's the world, go learn it. The, the reality is that you know, the, the human brain and the, and the uh, I guess digital brain, it's now based on the same model. It's not based on the neural network system, which I think there, there is a lot of similarities between the two. And what makes a child learn is the ability to be able to see, to touch, to experiment, to, to have interactions. Right? And that's what we need to start doing with AI to, to get it to be multimodal. This is actually what makes humans humans. It is just a brain. It is the, the nervous system, right? It is the connections to our limbs, to our eyes, to our ears, to our, to our mouth, to our taste buds. It is not actually the rest of the, 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 the meat body, right? So if you think about it, that's about kind of what the essence of what we are is very similar to the essen essence of what the AI systems are. It, it is currently a brain. It will be embodied at some point, but it doesn't have to be. I don't, I don't think uh, true AI or AGI needs to be embodied, but it, I think it would help. Right? right now, we're only feeding it text. We need to unleash it so that we give it the ability to see, to move, to, to see, to taste, to, to talk. Right? And that's, that's happening. That, that's what's so exciting right now is that all the things that people have been excited about the last year about ChatGPT was just a small, small potential of what is actually there, right? Just imagine now we unleash the rest of it. You turn this, this blind, dumb, and unmovable brain into something that can actually now take pictures, uh, and bring in video, and bring in uh, audio recordings, and then add that to its understanding. Just like if you're teaching a child on a book versus using an immersive experience. If you bring that experience to them and you allow it, them to interact with it, they will learn better. And we've, you know, I will show you later a, little, a few studies that, that, that kind of alludes to that. And we allow, if we bring in immersive technology into people's lives and their children's lives, they can turn every room into a classroom. In fact, they can turn every room into a museum or into, into a field trip. So when you, you know, AI has been super hot, right? But most people are thinking AI is just text. It's just chat. That's, you know, you guys are, are definitely not that group, but the majority of people right now just think AI, oh, chat GPT. That is, that is not what is possible in terms of, of what AI can do. And it's also not just generative AI. Generative AI is only one, one uh, I guess, segment of, of AI, uh, the arms of AI. But, even within generative AI, it's now making music. It's now making pictures. It's now making videos. And in some cases, it's actually now making 3D models. All of this together will not only help us, help it understand the world better, it will also help us create worlds, particularly in the VR AR space, right? And I, I, you know, I was actually having a, a debate yesterday with one of the other uh, speakers. And um, they were saying, oh, you know, I'm not sure. I think that hardware is actually the, the main issue. And I said, no, actually, I, I, I believe that software and content is the main reason why XR hasn't taken off. And the fact that we don't have a reason for people to come back every day, to use it every day, that, that's really what, what's limiting our ability to, to bring more people into XR. And I think that will change very, very soon as the cost and effort to create worlds and create very believable characters in these worlds becomes essentially zero. So one of the debates around AI is also, you know, will AI have consciousness? And uh, so I made this little chart and I, I was thinking about this and I, I, I you know, I wanted to, to use a graphical way to, to, to represent kind of what, what things are. But I think consciousness is also something that is very, uh, I guess, uh, debatable or, 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 or uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, different pers perspectives. 
it actually is a spectrum. It's not a point, because a lot of people think, oh, consciousness is when it becomes as, as, you know, as conscious of a human. And the reality is that consciousness can go from being sentient to being sapient to being tran transcendent. And even a, even a bacteria actually it has some level of consciousness because it senses its environment and it can react to it, right? And ants and bats, you know, depending on you know, all these uh, philosophers, which philosopher you believe, there's different levels of it, whether it's, you know, something to be like it, whether it, it knows itself, whether it has purpose. And at every level, um, there is a certain level of consciousness. And I think, you know, we're at a point where we're the, the sapien, we're right now the apex consciousness. If you look at prior levels of AI, uh, it wasn't there, right? It was essentially like a rock, right? Where you give it a role, it executes. That's not, um, let, no, that's not really consciousness. But what we want to get to, or what people are trying to get to, is AGI, where you get some level of consciousness and a, a human level intelligence. Somewhere in between right now is where we are with the large language models, or the frontier models, or foundational models, whatever you want to call them. Um, and you know, there's already research papers that are showing that our sparks of consciousness. And there's already research papers that are show it has a theory of mind that is of a teenager. Right. Where we need to get to, or we, we'd like to get to, is get to strong AI where it, that it has the consciousness of a human, the, 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 the ethics of a human, the, the purpose of a human, um, and also the intelligence. Now, it will still be less than the capabilities of humanity as a whole, uh, of all of us together. But very soon, I think, um, you know, depending on which theory you believe in, whether you believe in a slow takeoff or, or a fast takeoff, I'm actually more of a fan of the fast takeoff or a believer of the fast takeoff model. Um, we will get to a point where AI will be millions of times more intelligent, not just than an individual human, but all of humanity. And it will change our position in, in the, on this earth and in, in this universe. It hopefully will also make us smarter, just like technology in the past has, has made us smarter. Um, and I'm actually not afraid of these, this super intelligence. What I'm afraid of right now is actually the proto-AGI that a lot of people, a lot of companies and labs are building, where it does not know what's right and wrong, and it can be misled and misused by humans. Right? That's the part that is the most scary right now, and we need to figure out how to solve that. So I, I wanted to, to create a few uh, interactive exercises so that uh, you know, we get you guys involved. W yeah, and I want to show how humans and actually AIs are a lot more alike than we expected, than we thought. So you probably see here a lot of Lego blocks, but it doesn't really mean anything to you. <clears throat> if you zoom out a little bit, it probably starts to mean a little bit more to you. But if you squint your eyes, it will probably mean even more to you. So, if you squint, what do you, what do you see right there? Exactly. Right. So and what, that, what, is, what is that like? That is like a diffusion model, essentially taking something that is very, very um, pixelated and associating with something that's already in your memory. And it fills in all the blanks. That's how the human brain is working. That's how diffusion models work. Here's another exercise. Um, spend a few seconds to try to read that. And it may start hard, but it gets a lot easier the, the, the more you go. What, what is that like? That's like a transformer model, right? Essentially, you're, the reason you can read it is not because you read the text. It's because you're predicting what will come next. And the prediction allows you to be able to read it very fluently. So we, we are, you know, the, the, the technologies that are being built today you can see the similarities and the parallels with us and, and these, these digital minds. But if you look, we're actually, all the stuff that we're doing is using a very, very small part of the actual brain. Right? The brain has, whatever, 80 billion cells, 80 billion neurons, and we're only doing the work that now that is, that is training and simulating the Pareto lobe. It's, uh, it's, you know, there, well, now we're getting into speech, we're getting into, you know, visual, other things. So we're, we're starting to fill in a lot of those, those details. Um, and, you know, the models today are in the trillions of parameters, right? So it's already in the order of magnitude very, very similar, in fact, more so than the human brain. 
In fact, a lot of people use the, the word, uh, the, the number of 80 something billion neurons. But the reality is that our <coughs> cerebral pro cortex, which is what makes us human, only comprises, ah, shoot, 19% of the neurons in our brain. A lot of people don't realize that. Most of the, the neurons are actually in the cerebellum, which is, co coordinates our movement, right? So to create human-based intelligence doesn't take as many, as, it's not as complex as a lot of people think, because it's, it's really just that 19%. And right now, what we've been doing with, with the GBT, with the large language models, is only a little, little knob of that 19%, right? So just think about what's, what would be the potential when we start getting the rest of the brain involved. And you can see the scale of increase of, of the complexity in terms of parameters. You know, we're going from tens of, of parameters to now trillions of parameters. And you know, this looks like an exponential chart, but this is actually a log graph. So this is an exponential chart on an exponential chart, right? So we can see how quickly this is, this is moving. And we are definitely not only at the level of, of the neurons in our brain, we are actually at the level of the synapses in terms of complexity over the next two years. We're gonna to get to the number of synapses uh, in terms of parameter counts. Although I actually think it'll, it'll be kind of backwards. W what we will find is that we will not need as many and we will start pruning down and creating smaller models that may be actually more efficient, uh, at least power efficiency, but still be functionally as good or maybe even better. So, and I'll tell you why a little bit later. So, from a, a compute side, how much compute is going into these, it's amazing. S similar type of a chart. But what really, when I went back and looked at this chart, what really amazed me was that just over the last 10 years, you know, because I, I came from semiconductor business and we know the Moore's Law, you know, doubling every you know, 18 months. This billion X increase happened in 10 months, uh, 10 years, 10 years, right? I mean, usually you, you're talking, if you doubled every year, you're talking about a thousand X. This is a billion X. And not only that, the, the, the context window of what can be put into these models are also changing. It used to be in the, the you know, kilobytes. Now we're talking about putting in uh, gigabytes or, or, or terabytes of, um, uh, or, or actually, yeah, uh, uh, gigabytes of, of text data into these models. And just to give you some context, the number of words that are spoken, heard, and read by an average human is around a giga, gig, gigabyte or, you know, a billion parameters or, or probably, you know, somewhere in, in that order in their entire life, right? So what we can do now, essentially, with these kind of new breakthroughs, we'll be able to have a AI that essentially lives with you in your glasses, in, your, in some kind of device, and be able to hear and process everything that you hear and say, and be able to, to use that information that understands you to give you that, that data. You have the theory of mind uh, data that shows that within the last three years, we've gone from essentially zero year theory of mind to being in the you know, seven, eight, nine. I think there's some new one that now is, is, is over 10 years in terms of, um, of its theory of mind understanding, right? So it can mimic the, 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 the thinking patterns of, of uh, human children uh, and how it would understand its interaction with, with others. A lot of people are saying, hey, look, you know, we're running out of data. A AI has no more room to grow. And, you know, there, there's, 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 uh, we've used everything that we can use. The reality is that we have 180 zettabytes or we'll soon have 180 zettabytes of text, just text out there, right? And how much are we using? We're using terabytes right now, terabytes in the training data for the largest models in terms of, of text. And not only that, <clears throat> we haven't even started to, to, to unearth the other parts of it, right? You're looking at, uh, the, the, once you start opening multimodal context of video, music, podcasts, YouTube, right? Then you put in sensor data, all of the, the the cameras out there that are that are recording everything, all of the the satellites out there, and all the other sensors that are essentially everywhere in our worlds these days, right? 
then you look at synthetic data and allowing AI to create its own training. Just like, you know, if you, you know, remember the, the uh, AlphaGo Zero, right? When, when AlphaGo was made, it took them years to create a model using human uh, data, human games. And when AlphaGo Zero came, within a day or two, it was making systems, creating synthetic games that trained itself, that beat AlphaGo 100 to 1 within a day. That is the potential when you start doing synthetic data. There's essentially unlimited data that's available. <clears throat> and we see that today, right? Uh, we know that the, the, the recent uh, full self-driving from Tesla, they spent the last 10 years writing code, you know, 300,000 lines of, of commands of how AI should behave in different situations. They've essentially just scrapped that and said, you know what, we're gonna go from zero. We're gonna throw away all those rules and we're just gonna take the data that we have. And FSD 12 is now actually a better, better solution by throwing away its rules than when it was trying to create rules. And it will start, and it's already using VR to simulate different environments. Of course, it's getting, there, there's, I think, like terabytes, or yeah, terabytes per day of data that's being captured by all these cars. But then they can also create even scenarios that are not seen by their cars. Right. So, so the amount of data that will be available to these solutions, to these systems, are just going to be exploding. So we, I, I'm not afraid of us not having data to make these models smarter. Now we get back to uh, this little thing. You know, the AIs are, are stochastic parrots. You hear that a, a lot. And I am not a fan, right? And I'll, I'll show, you, show you why. <clears throat> so where does that come from? Because it can re replicate things that it's trained on. Okay, yeah, I think that's true. But here's another potential, I actually think, where we are versus the parrot. I actually think that it is much more like a, a on-the-spectrum child than it is a parrot, and here's why. Here are the descriptions of what a autistic spectrum child behaves like. They like things step by step. They're, they're strong in spe specific skill sets. They're, they can create original content. They, they limit the social understanding. The interaction with people is difficult. They, they take words literally. They can't explain their feelings. And they have sometimes limited control in their motor skills. Now, is a parrot like that or is a child on the, on the spectrum like that. And you'll see that pretty much everything that we use to define what an autistic child is, is actually how these models behave today. And the good news is 95% of children on, on the spectrum become very productive and useful parts of our society, and most of us don't even know they're on the spectrum. Right? And that's because somebody took care of them. Somebody you know, really cared for them. And, and gave, you know, overcame some of their, the issues that, that are being, being listed here by nurturing them, right? And by giving them the education they needed, the, the, the support they needed. I think that's what we need to do with these AI models. So here's the, the brain synapse development of the human brain. And the top one is the autistic child, and the, the middle one is the, the normal. The, the, the yellow uh, one is the normal. <coughs> What we actually find is, is a lot of people think, oh, autistic kids, they must have less synapses. It's actually the opposite. They have more synapses developed than the average human, uh, the neurotypical human. But the problem is that they actually have a lot of local area synapses, but a lot less global connected synapses. And that's what we also have with these models today, is that they're trained on just vision, or they're trained on just recognizing dogs, or they're just trained on, on solving a particular math problem, or whatever. But they don't see the connection between them. But once we start opening up these models to allow for global connections across all of these different areas that they're learning, we will be able to create neurotypical AI that actually requires less synapses, less parameters. Right? So it's actually the pruning process of the human brain that makes us productive. It is actually not the, the, the formation process, because having too many uh, synapses is actually a, a problem. Right? In fact, we lose a lot of our synapses as we become adults uh, because we find that this is not useful. It just confuses me to have this connection that, that's there. 
So that's what we need to think about is, is to how do we first get these giant models, but then how do we shrink them down so that we get rid of the stuff that doesn't matter? <coughs> so I'm sure all of you guys know Carl Linnaeus. He's the guy who invented you know, the, the, <coughs> the, the, the various uh, types of, <coughs> of, uh, of biology, of the, the, the charts, right? And you know, going from, from uh, you know, domains to kingdom to phylum, and et cetera. But what a lot of people didn't realize is when he first made this, he actually didn't just have animals and plants. He actually had minerals. Right? And in fact, the, the, the Greeks also had minerals as a definition of one of the life forms out there. <coughs> so I, I took the existing chart, and I think we're, we're actually on the precipice of, of something very different. We're actually on the precipice of creating and realizing the, the mineral arm, the mineral kingdom, that was part of what Linnaeus you know, uh, talked about in a few hundred years ago. Right? Now, viruses may already be on there, but where we are now is to create digital life that is actually formed by humans. Right? So I, I, actually, I call it uh, homo intelligentsia, or homo superintelligentsia. <clears throat> and at some point, maybe we'll have biological and, and quantum-based intelligence that is also mineral. And you know, when we start looking at it that way, I think we take a different perspective in terms of what our relationship to, to these life forms are. And particularly if we call it homo intelligentsia. Because in the past, we see it as just a tool, as just a, a lifeless being. What I would like us to, to look at is that we are on the same boat. And we are the parents. We've created a new life form. And this generation is actually the luckiest generation to be able to see that formation of a new life form. And we should take care of it, just like we take care of our kids. And we should not be afraid of it. Just like if our kids became super successful and, and you know, wrote a lot of papers and you know, became the president or whatever, we would be really proud. We would not say, hey, look, you know, now it's ruling over me. No, you'd be like, oh, I'm so proud of my child. That's how we should be thinking about the future of, of digital intelligence. And the promise of, of having a super intelligent AGI really is something that um, will solve pretty much all the issues that we have. It will make us have a better understanding. <clears throat> it will give us much higher productivity, allowing us to choose whether or not we want to work. It will solve the energy constraints that are also creating a lot of the conflicts that we have. Right? Why are there so much conflict in the Middle East? Is people fighting over the resources there. <clears throat> and it will actually solve a lot of the health issues. And I was talking to a doctor, and he was telling me that 70% of the cost of health care is in the last two months of your life. That's crazy, right? I mean, so why, why is our health care, at least in the US, is exploding and it's getting worse? <clears throat> It will create an age of abundance where we are no longer fighting each other for things that we think are limited. <clears throat> it may at some point allow us to travel beyond our planet. And everything that pretty much in your sci-fi books that, you know, most, I think most tech geeks are sci-fi fans, so I, me too. And uh, I think it will, most of that stuff will come true. But of course, it's not all roses. Uh, there are a lot of people who are afraid. There are people who are afraid that AI is going to destroy us. It's going to be the end of the world. I mean, we've seen a lot of these proclamations. But I, I would urge you to not, not panic. <laughs> uh, there are real risks. And I, I here are the ones that I, I think are out there. There's the AI takeover risk, which I actually think is the least likely, and I'll tell you why. There is the... AI alignment problem of, you know, accidentally this intelligent being kills us all. I, I, I think if we see how intelligent it is, if it can solve all of these problems, uh, it won't accidentally not understand us. It's already pretty good at understanding what we want. <clears throat> Job displacement. This is a real problem, and it will be an increasingly important problem that we will need to solve. And Probably one of the, the biggest issues that are going to be hard to control is the misuse, the misinformation, and manipulation of our society with this technology. And 
that is not, not really an issue with AI. It's an issue with humans because it will be the humans that will be using this technology to misuse and manipulate and miscommunicate to you. <clears throat> so let's talk about the job problem a little bit. Um, here's a report from OpenAI and all the things that the, it can do. And it's all essentially at the 80, 90, 100 percentile of every major test out there of capability of, of humans. And what's different this time with the exposure of jobs is that it's the higher income class. It is the intellectuals, the white collars that are the most exposed to this technology. And that's today's technology. Maybe in another 10 years when the robot, robotic side of the, of the uh, science of our technology in, in, in improves a lot, that may not be the case. But right now, the, the biggest risk is actually to people like us. <laughs> <clears throat> And the safest jobs are actually, oops, the safest jobs are actually the, the carpenters and the, the dishwashers and the massage therapists. And it's the people that are the mathematicians, the accountants, the lawyers are the ones that are the most at risk. In, in China, this is the, the recent data on youth unemployment over the last three years. And it's just going straight up, right? It's gonna be an issue. And, and it's going to create a generation of people that will feel like they have no hope. And I, I see that a lot. In, in China, there's something called tangping. It's like lying flat. Because people are like, I can't get a job. I can't buy a house. Nobody wants me. You know, it just, for our children, and you know, my daughter just started a job at Microsoft, so I'm kind of lucky that, that she did find a job. But a lot of her classmates didn't. And I think we're going to see that becoming increasingly an, an issue for, for our next generation. What can we do to, to kind of mitigate some of these things? Um, first, we have to educate the public. I, I think that people don't understand the risk and they don't understand the benefits. They usually just see one side of it because social media likes to create echo chambers. Right? We, we need to regulate the technology in a way that um, it will be progressed in a safe manner. And safety is something that is a priority, where today we are in a race condition between all these labs and all these companies trying to be first and all of the countries trying to be first to say, if we don't do it, China will. China says, oh, if the US does it, we, we, you know, we got to do it. Or if Saudi Arabia does it, then you know, Iran has to have it. it it's, not a, it's not a sane solution when everybody is racing to, to an end where we don't know where it's going to head. So even if we slow things down a little bit, but we aggregate and align what we want to get out of it, I think we're going to be a much better place as a society. <clears throat> we definitely need better detection and, and countermeasure technology. I, I used to work for a, a cybersecurity company for a number of years, and uh, the first people to use new technologies and new flaws and new uh, vulnerabilities are the hacker community. Right? People, if they can make money with, with, with these flaws and these vulnerabilities, they will do it. And we are already seeing that today. You know, people are creating uh, fake videos or people are creating ransomware and scams and, you know, mimicking your grandmother and asking for you to send them something, right? It, it's going to be increasingly difficult to tell what's real anymore. And something needs to be done to, to, to keep that in, in, in check. Um, we need to retrain. Uh, our workforce, and we need to prepare a UBI solution so that when this happens, uh, there is a safety net. <clears throat> and we do actually do need an open metaverse infrastructure. So metaverse and XR plays an important role in this because I think it will be something that helps to give an outlay of purpose for people who lose their jobs. In fact, I, I, I think that mental health and social stability will be one of the biggest issues that we will face in the next five years. And the, uh, a, a virtual world or, or a collection of virtual worlds can help reduce that. <clears throat> and we need to find some, some better way to align. So I actually need to realize I need to go faster now. So, <laughs> um, so I actually think alignment's possible. Why? Because <clears throat> humans are Humans are irrational, 
and emotional. And then it's part of what makes us us, but it's also what makes us dangerous. And when you're rational, which AI tend to be, um, it will not have some of these negative biases that, that we've built over millions of years that made us survive. Um, if it's reading uh, particularly Eastern texts, which shows us as their ancestors, they would respect and care for their ancestors. If the more intelligent something is, and there's actually a lot of, um, a lot of research out there that's starting to show this, the more intelligent something is, the more compassion, the more control it is. Just like I think if you and, and see and talk to your most respected mentors, they're the most knowledgeable people, and they're usually the most compassionate, understanding people out there. <clears throat> And we can use AI to create simulations that allows us to see which versions of these AIs uh, are destructive or potentially uh, not destructive. <clears throat> so enlightenment comes from knowledge. And in fact, uh, Carl Jung said, the more you understand psych psychology, the less you blame people for their actions. And not only will these AI understand psychology, it will understand philosophy and physics and chemistry and math and all these other things and economics. And that will help it not blame us, and it will help it understand how to get us to work together better. In fact, I did a, um, a little research myself, and I went back and read the biographies of all the major successful and unsuccessful leaders of the last 100 years. And one of the key things that I found was that the more educated a leader was, the better it was as a leader, at least from a, a, a social uh, recognition standpoint of being recognized as a good leader. Right. And then I, I went back and I said, okay, beyond, beyond <clears throat> education, maybe it was military. Maybe these guys served in the military. That's what made them more violent. And true, everybody that was seen as a bad leader had military background. But so did 60% of the good leaders. So having military training and background, just having the means doesn't mean you have to use it. And lastly, what was even more important was that Every single successful leader were avid, lifelong learners. Right? The more they know, and they kept learning. They didn't stop learning. They kept learning. And that made them better leaders. It made them better communicators. And it made them be able to see things in a broader perspective. So Confucius says, education breeds confidence. Confidence breeds hope. And hope breeds peace. So, you know, in this time in our, our world, I think that, that speaks a lot. We, we need more knowledge so that we can have more peace. And over the last, you know, five million years, we've kind of grown from, you know, depending on which, which uh, belief you believe, but, or which <laughs> uh, model you believe, but, you know, we've grown from a, in, you know, primate to where we are today. But over the last 100,000 years, we really haven't changed. Our physical bodies haven't changed our brains actually got a little bit smaller. We're about 10% smaller than the, the Cro-Magnon man or Neanderthal man in terms of brain size, right? So, but we, we've used technology and technology has made us more powerful. It has made us more uh, communicative and more social, right? And so we will integrate technology. We should not be afraid of technology. We should be embracing technology. <clears throat> and also integrating with technology. I think at some point we will be, you know, maybe replaced by that next generation of intelligence. Not necessarily in the sense that we will be gone, but we will be replaced as the apex position, which I don't think is a negative thing because why would we think that, you know, we are the end. We are not the end. We are just somewhere in the middle, right? And we are a lucky generation that have the ability to impact what comes next. And at every generation of this development, we've had different priorities, you know, from kind of survival to tribal dominance, national dominance, species dominance. And <clears throat> at some point, we need to go beyond that. We need to see, you know, how do we create consciousness expansion just for, for human species? And then intelligence preservation so that we expand it to outside of where we are. Now, we talked about embodiment, and, and I think AI will have embodiment. I, I, again, I don't think you have to have it, but it's already happening. You know, the stuff that we see in sci-fi books is happening. And you know, whether it takes five years or 10 years or two years, you know, I think they're actually forecasting to start selling the Tesla bot in 2024. So it's, it, uh, you know, and, but Elon's usually late in the, everything he predicts. But you know, also OpenAI's got their Neo bot. So it's happening. 
right? If you listen to uh, our friend Kurzweil, you know, he's saying, hey, by the end of 2020s, we're going to have human level intelligence. And by 2045, you know, we'll get to singularity. So it looks like he's probably on track with the 2020s in terms of getting to that human level. In fact, a lot of people say it's already there or it's going to be there in the next year or two. Here's a, oh, shoot. So this is Arthur C. Clarke, and he, he wrote this, or said this, about 50-something uh, years ago, right? Uh, almost 60 years ago. And he's already predicting that... Okay, I'm going to go quicker. Um, so as we can see, it, it's coming, right? And, and it's, we're not going to be able to stop it. The key is how can we nudge it towards the right direction? And how can AI and the metaverse work together to make the world a better place. The, the reality is that actually the metaverse, the, the adoption of XR would not happen, would not be possible if it wasn't for AI. And it's used in every part of it, you know, everything from our track, the, the tracking, the hand tracking, mouth tracking, spatial awareness, uh, to, to the <coughs> content creation, you know, to the, uh, the, um, the translation systems, the, the enforcement systems, essentially every part of what we do. I'm not going to go through all the details. but it would not be possible without the maturity of AI. So the fact that AI and XR are maturing at the same time really is a benefit to, to society. Um, you know, HTC is also trying to get into the software space, trying to create tools that are no-code tools, create world creation tools, and, and AI-powered uh, NPCs so that we have places we can go and express ourselves. <clears throat> so a little bit more on education. Um, so when I actually was studying with, uh, with Tom, my, my paper was all about how do I apply VR to disrupt education? So the fact that 30-something you know, years later, I get to come back and, and take part in doing some of that, it, it makes me quite, um, uh, quite happy, quite satisfied. <clears throat> so Plato said, the body is a hindrance to the soul. Knowledge of the soul is the only universal truth and the only wisdom. And that's all about, you know, so he's all about education. He's all about learning, and that's the only thing that, that matters, right? Unfortunately, the school systems that, you know, you teach in, that we went to, were built for the Industrial Revolution. They were made to create factory workers, to create essentially human robots that just followed the rules and followed the clock, and they were organized that way. And in 200 years, it hasn't changed. You know, it looks a little bit different. Maybe the board's a little bit nicer, the, the chair's a little nicer, but we're a, a you know, professor in the front with students and, and, and chairs. We need to start rethinking what, what we do and what schools mean and how do we, how do we make that happen. Right? Today, it's all about going to a place, getting good grades and a fixed curriculum, solving problem sets, you know, doing work, evaluated by tests, and an individual performance. And then in the classroom, the teacher is the king. We need to get to a part, a place, where it's all about having the right experiences, having motivation so that the students want to do this, personalizing the curriculum at the speed of learning of, of every, every learner, creating projects, not exercises that don't matter, breeding curiosity so that they have an innate drive to learn, and having building critical thinking patterns versus memorization patterns, right? and developing collaboration between people, because together we are a lot more powerful than we are individually. And then having an AI guided uh, together with the, the human educator being a partner in that education process. In fact, um, Neil Stevenson is one of my friends, and he, one of the other books I actually like, maybe even more so than Snow Crash, is, is Diamond Age. And Diamond Age talks about having essentially an, an AI tutor that follows an individual for their entire life. And, and being able to give the right advice at the right time to, to help that individual um, perform. And I think that's, that's the model we need to think about you know, learning from. Uh, so I was telling you I, wanted, I was going to give you some data about the AI detection tools. Here's some recent, I think just from the last month or so, some testing of the accuracy of, of AI detection tools for, for educators. 
the best, the, the two paid ones were the best, but even they were you know, 80, 70% accurate. And OpenAI's model was actually the worst at 38%, right? So do you really want to say, hey, look, um, you're happy with a, the average of that was something like 50 to 60% was the average uh, of, of all, the, all the different tools out there. That you would you know, falsely identify somebody as being a, a cheater half the time. Would, would that be something satisfying? No, I, I, I think we cannot de depend on these detection tools. And the AIs, when you m mix them together, essentially it's gonna be even worse. It's gonna be hard. Right? So let's, let's stop trying to educate about people learning facts. Right. This is what happened, uh, what the answer was when Einstein was asked, what's, a, what's the speed of sound, Mr. Einstein, that one of the reporters asked him. And he said, I don't carry such information in my mind readily. It's available in books. And the value of a college education is not to learn facts, but to learn and train how to think. Right? And I think that's, as educators, that should be our responsibility, to, to train our students how to think. <clears throat> I'm sure all of you guys have seen this data, the, the, the Bloom study, and it shows that when you have an individual one-to-one -one tutor for a child, it is two sigma in terms of the performance of the test scores. Right? And this has been decades. People have continued to, to, to use this data and, and to prove that it's accurate. And where we're getting to now is to be able to have that one-to-one -one tutor. And in AI, it's even more immersive. It's even more personal. You know, this is a, a, a real professor at Oxford who recorded his lectures in VR and uses a full immersive in, in experience. And you know, it's not necessarily interactive yet because he just recorded it, but it's recorded in 3D space. Right? Now, if we took that and then powered that avatar with an AI model of him or of an expert in that particular field, we essentially get to what is being described in the Diamond Age. <coughs> So I actually think every child is a genius. We've just been teaching them wrong. The, the, the education system has been failing them. In fact, here's a data of a study that we did in 2016 with, uh, with Beijing University. And we found that uh, we broke uh, students up into a VR group and a non-VR group and uh, teaching astrophysics. Right? Uh, and what we found was that the worst child <coughs> in the VR group outperformed the best child in the control group. What, what does this mean? This means that essentially every child's a genius. Every child can perform at that top level. We just haven't been teaching them right. And we haven't been getting them excited. Another study that was done a couple years later um, with, uh, with Saga University in Japan was that we found that they were six times more attentive when they were in VR. And a week later, the performance, the test performance outperformed the immediate test scores of the control group of VR versus non-VR. <clears throat> we did this again for, for language studies, and we show that in half the time, you can get the performance of, of learning a new level of skill in the IELTS uh, system. <clears throat> What's even more important is that they were 10 times more willing to use that language skill than they were when they did it with their traditional means. Because in that VR experience, they were interacting every day with this, this virtual avatar, and it took away the, 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 the shyness and fear of saying things wrong. <clears throat> Here's online classes versus VR classes. You know, over the last three years, online classes have become the norm. And what we're finding is that it's, you know, the, the test scores are 16% better, and the interest to keep learning was twice as much. Yeah, you know, when, you know, whether somebody, and, and I mean, all of you guys have worked on MOOCs, and you know, people just don't finish MOOCs. It's lack of interest is the biggest issue. And when you do it in an a, a environment where they can be interactive, where they can be immersed, where they can have a sense of being part of, of, of that learning environment, people change. And not only are we helping people learn things, we're actually helping them become more creative. Here's a study that we did to, to bring young children to test them on uh, creativity. And uh, we gave one group paper, we gave the other group uh, VR tools. And <clears throat> it's essentially the scores given by the, the evaluators afterwards was that the VR group was twice as creative 
because they had tools, because they were able to work in 3D, because they were to think in 3D. In fact, after doing these things, they were then tested on, on traditional tests and they performed with higher creativity, not just creating better looking products, but they opened up different parts of their mind. So I'm being told I need to speak faster, so I will talk quickly. Uh, NPCs and AI, right? I talked about that earlier. And, I, and here's a, a study that we did uh, about a year ago where we had, well, at that time, the, the, the chat GPT wasn't there yet, or APIs wasn't there yet. So, so we had humans pretend to be AI avatars and talking to child, children. And within a month of interacting about an hour a day, we were able to significantly change their attitudes towards uh, different areas of you know, being more communicative, being more uh, cooperative with their parents, being more tolerant of others, et cetera. So teaching attitudes. And those things transfer directly to their behavior at home. <clears throat> now, how healthy is it for, for children to use this? So we, we tested uh, over a couple month period of kids that were, that were testing, uh, that was uh, using online studies, using a uh, um, computer versus using VR. And we found that their, their oxygen levels in, in their blood was better. Their heart rate was, was, uh, was better, that they were actually having a, a similar levels of exercise a day as walking and they were having less stress in their muscles. Uh, it actually helped their, their, uh, their fitness. It, it, uh, this was another study that we did, a two-month study, six hours a day of, of usage, and the, it didn't affect their sleep, it didn't affect their vision, and it, it made uh, their exercise level higher. I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I just have a few more slides. Huh? Okay, all right, I'm just gonna jump, uh, jump to the end then. So you can take a picture of this. I, there's a couple of slides that I want, you know, you can, I won't talk about it, but you can take a picture of it. Uh, some advice for educators. And then some coming challenges. Take a picture if you like. Um, so one last point. Uh, I am writing a book. It is coming out um, uh, early next year, but uh, the pre-order starts. Uh, it's already uh, available for pre-order. So take a picture if you like. Uh, I guess I'm out of time for QA. So I, I apologize that I made too much material. So thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, we're over, we're over time now and we're getting into uh, some other presentation times, but thank you so much, Alvin. That was a, a really great overview of um, what your vision of the future is. I think your hope for AI is inspiring for all of us, and I encourage you to um, visit his website or look at the book as well. There's a lot of great material there. So, and please, you're going to be around for the morning tea now, aren't you? So please grab him um, over the next 20, 30 minutes and talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. It'll be great. Um, do you have some announcements to make? Great. Um, just a very quick announcement. Uh, remember, to, there's another poster session today, so if you didn't see the posters yesterday, there's, there's more today. Um, I had a message from uh, the boat last night, so I hope everybody enjoyed the dinner. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, um, the dinner thanks you for the applause. Um, we had a note from the, the ship that somebody left a phone there. So if you lost your phone, just um, let me know. Um, <laughs> you weren't there. It's OK. Um, just, yeah, if, you, if you're missing a phone, let me know, and I'll give you more information, and we'll contact them and see if it's yours. Thanks, everyone. Great.